I went to a military school. I uh, was called upon by the commandant of Fort Benning who asked me if I wanted to play football for the post team. I said yes, I wanted to say no to a general. And after the season ended, we were disbanded. I was sent to join the 90th Infantry Division, who was then stationed at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And I, we were there until March of 44, when the division was sent to England to overseas. After we were there about two and a half, three months, in the middle of May, we were moved to cities in England that were ports that would lead to the channel for the invasion. And we still didn't know where we are going. After we left sight of land, we were told, what are we going to do? Horizon, horizon. Battleship, destroyers, cruisers, and hearing and seeing a battleship fire is unbelievable. And I thought nothing could live there on the beach, but they did. We'd never been in combat before, and it was a first three days or so, you know, somewhat in shock. I mean, it's almost impossible to describe the feeling of seeing your, your friends killed. And it's, after a while, it's hard to say, but you didn't get used to it, but you have to accept it. And as days progressed, we got better at what we did. We became combat veterans. I was never, never the same after that. I'm not today. And it's hard. I, I enjoyed my military experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And uh, I had a rather hard time adjusting to it. I mean, to civilian life. <laughs> I didn't want to take my uniform off, and my dad said, you know, he got out of that uniform, and he bought me some clothes. I didn't have any clothes, uh, civilian clothes. One of the most difficult things I had to do was with my language. <laughs> I had a very hard time with that, but I actually became a civilian. He started coming to church uh, when his wife was sick with cancer, and uh, he was kind of looking for a place to um, I think deal with stuff that was just coming up. You know, when you meet him, you realize just how strong he is inwardly and outwardly. And uh, I think it, it, his leadership would almost be irresistible. You know, he's not shy about his uh, telling his story, though I think it, it's, his willingness to begin to tell his story some years ago um, has been very healing for him. In 1994, Bob was sitting in a circle with me and a number of other people. And at the time, I was teaching American history, so we study all about World War II, in a book. But it suddenly occurred to me that we needed a talk to Bob. I did it for the main reason, because there are not too many of us left, and I wanted them to hear from somebody that had been there, and basically what it was like. So Bob and a dear friend of his, Bill Hager, came in. He went to her classroom and visited and um, uh, just blew him away. Bob was telling us about guys, like guys from West Virginia that he knew who didn't make it off their platoon boats because they were just shot up right there in the water. I can't tell anybody what it was really like. You have to experience it yourself, but I, I just wanted them to know what I went through. Out of his war experience, he really became a peacemaker. He, he doesn't like war. He thinks it's the last thing that should happen. And so the leadership almost comes out of his uh, brokenness. When I've talked with Bob, what I've learned over the years as he's told that story is that he was just scared spitless. Not just the fighting, it's the, the conditions that you live under. You know, you're, you're exposed to the elements. If it rains, you're soaking wet. Maybe for days on end. Yeah, you, you don't really sleep. And then a battlefield, or a 
combat area. It's uh, the smell of death is everywhere, decaying bodies. It's a uh, very, very gruesome out of atmosphere. Get accustomed to it. Otherwise, you won't survive.